Over the past five months, people in Massachusetts have flattened the curve on COVID-19, but they also have the nation's highest unemployment rate. But along the way, there were dozens of people who died after potential exposure in the workplace and hundreds of complaints about workplace conditions and policies. Those are among the findings in a report from Mass Kosh. To tell us about the report is its Labor Community Training Coordinator and Organizer, Ben Wallerstein. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Ben. Yeah, of course, thanks for having me. But I wanna start with maybe uh, having you give a sense of perspective here. You know, when people look at these daily numbers, it does seem as if things are getting better, but on the other hand, you say we are in an unprecedented crisis. Why is it still a crisis? Um, well, it's still a crisis um, because workers are still going to work in workplaces that are lacking in necessary health and safety protections. Um, people are still getting sick and uh, unfortunately people are still losing their lives due to COVID-19. Um, obviously things, the, the numbers, if you look here in Massachusetts are much better than when they peaked uh, and were on the rise back in April and May. Um, but we still have not put into place the uh, necessary protections for all types of, uh, of transmission of this virus. Um, in particular, many workplaces are lacking protection for airborne transmission of COVID-19, of, of the virus that causes COVID-19, um, which is, is leaving workers unprotected, um, especially essential workers. Uh, I want to look at uh, the kinds of things that can go, go wrong, because one of the things you went into at some length in this report was what happened to a 69-year-old worker at a Walmart store. Now, may, maybe Walmart has cleaned up its act since then, but just walk us through the things that went wrong and, and maybe how the worst outcome that actually took place could have been avoided. Yeah, so the, the case in Walmart at the Quincy Walmart store um, was uh, very interesting and very disturbing. Um, this was a case where um, on April 3rd uh, was the first known um, positive COVID case associated with that store. Um, and in the weeks following, the store management kept that information hidden, kept, kept the fact that there were positive cases of workers in the store hidden from other workers, as well as from the Quincy Health Department, um, and told workers to, that their coworkers who were in fact quarantining because they were sick, told, those people, told, told their coworkers that those people were on vacation. Um, and was that we're actually forcing those people to use vacation time rather than allowing them to take paid uh, time off to quarantine as Walmart had said they would do in a company policy that they had put forward earlier on. Um, and they, they essentially hit an outbreak. They hit an outbreak that um, we have different numbers saying how many total cases, uh, one count is 29, um, uh, 29 store employees and family members, another count is 34 store employees. Uh, so the numbers are still not clear, but the, what we do know is that Walmart hid the outbreak from its own employees uh, as long as it possibly could until the Quincy Health Commissioner actually figured out what was going on and was able to um, get into that store and uh, inspect it and close it down temporarily for a more thorough cleaning. Um, but by that time, you know, a large number of workers had already been infected um, and we go in depth in, in the Dying Fork report about Yokian Lee, who uh, was a greeter at that store. She, um, she passed away, it was on May 3rd, which is one month after that first positive test. Um, and you know, in her case, she tried very hard to get time off. Um, she started feeling sick in mid-April. Um, I spoke to her daughter, who gave me a lot of the, the details about what happened, as well as the Quincy Health Commissioner. Um, it was on, uh, you know, she, she tried to take sick time. She tried to uh, get time off because she was feeling unwell. She had run out of sick time. So she then was told to take vacation time, but she was never given the opportunity to take, uh, just, just to take paid time off to quarantine, even though she was symptomatic, right? Had, had COVID-19 symptoms. Um, and she wasn't actually granted that time off until after she had been hospitalized for almost a week. Well, it would be nice to think of this Walmart is an outlier, part of a big chain with a remote headquarters. But, but what about other workplaces and the ability of other workers to uh, you know, stay home if they have symptoms or if they need to quarantine? Exactly, so the, the challenge that this particular Walmart employee faced was by no means uh, you know, an isolated incident. Um, you know, 
certainly at other Walmart locations, this pattern of, of Walmart in particular denying outbreaks, hiding, covering up, um, and making it difficult for people to take time off um, is something we've, we've heard from other Walmart stores as well as other employers here in Massachusetts. The attorney's, attorney general's office um, for a while had a complaint form for complaints related to COVID-19 um, that was up for, uh, they, they closed it uh, near the end of August. So it was up for, for I wanna say two or three months. And in that time, they received over 300 complaints of workers uh, saying that, that they or, or their coworkers were allowed to work while symptomatic, that, that employers were allowing people to come into work while experiencing symptoms. Um, and, and we know that this isn't really an issue of the employer allowing someone to come in while symptomatic, so much as employers uh, failing to give paid time off to people who need to quarantine. Um, you know, employers have not been informing workers of their right to do that under the, uh, the FFCRA, the Federal um, Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, you know, workers, uh, employers have not been providing um, emergency, in many cases have not been providing emergency uh, paid time off when someone needs to quarantine, but has run out of their sick time. And we're actually pushing for an emergency paid sick leave bill um, at the state house here in Massachusetts. But there's been a lot of reporting about the enormous share of COVID-19 fatalities in elder care facilities. But I was struck by one thing in your report, uh, the racial disparity uh, among fatalities and the workers in those facilities. Tell us about that. Yeah, um, so of the, I, I, I believe uh, there, were, there were 31 workers um, who, uh, there, there, were, there were 31 nursing home workers um, that, that died uh, from COVID-19 um, for whom we know their race or ethnicity. Um, of those 31, 10 of them were, uh, were African-American, um, you know, nearly a third. Um, and, and this is something we've seen, uh, you know, not just in nursing home workers, but across the board, um, you know, in, in many industries, many essential industries that, um, that, that it is, uh, you know, the industries being hit hardest are the ones with the highest rates of black and uh, Hispanic workers. Um, and, and, you know, this is, uh, you know, evident in, in the state's analysis of COVID cases overall. Um, but we know that work plays a big role in that because we know that the people who work the uh, frontline essential jobs and have been working those jobs throughout the pandemic, have been going to work outside the home, have been in contact with the public, um, that disproportionately the workforce in those industries, in those occupations are black and brown workers. Well, early on in, in the pandemic, we had some really serious problems with access to personal protective equipment. How do things look now? So that's a great question. Um, I think it you know, has varied a lot by workplace. Um, what we, what we did find in our report um, was that personal protective equipment, uh, or rather issues of a lack of personal protective equipment, um, were the, the sort of second highest category of complaints uh, that were sent to the Attorney General's office um, from, um, from, from workers. Uh, customers of stores may also have sent in some of those complaints, but probably many of the complaints about PPE were coming from workers. Um, you know, there were, there were uh, many hundreds um, you know, of, of complaints uh, regarding PPE issues. Um, yeah. Do you think maybe there ought to be more help for people? Is, maybe there are small businesses that might be hurting for ways so, to provide this too. Yeah, what, one of the, one of the uh, many list of demands that we included in the report are you know, pr proposed uh, policies to address this ongoing worker health and safety crisis. Um, is to increase the Defense Production Act at the federal level to expand that to uh, require further production of personal protective equipment um, and medical supplies um, at the federal level. And then of course, you know, to, to see a corollary of that at the state level for the state to uh, you know, work with more manufacturers to produce, uh, to produce PPE in particular N95 respirators. Um, it would be wonderful to see an N95 respirator available for anybody working in an indoor setting with, uh, you know, with others, with, with another person. Um, obviously, N95s are, you know, there, there, there's not enough N95s available right now for that to happen. So that would be uh, definitely ideal. What about the return to in-person education at schools? There are some places around the country, maybe with 
higher rates of infection where teachers have died. But on the other hand, there were communities in Massachusetts where infection rates are so low, people were wondering, uh, why can't we reopen? So, um, I think it is, it is critical that we remember that schools are workplaces. Um, and, you know, in, in addition to, to being schools, right? Um, we, we've, we've seen that work, right? People having to go to work has been a, a major uh, factor in this pandemic continuing, um, in, in the virus continuing to be transmitted. Um, you know, I, I definitely agree with you, Chris, that it, it's, uh, you know, looking at the data in, in, a, in a regional uh, level and town by town is important um, and that the kind of things to look for might vary place by place. Um, but, you know, the reality is we know this pandemic is not over anywhere here in Massachusetts. You know, obviously it is, it is hitting some areas worse than others, but it is not over anywhere. Um, and we have to remember that, you know, the, the, the teachers and the other, you know, school staff going into that building are doing that in order to make a living and no one should have to risk their life in order to earn a living. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we, we often are seeing in this debate with uh, how to reopen schools, whether to reopen schools, obviously, you know, cost comes up. Can we afford to upgrade our ventilation? Can we afford to buy the protective equipment necessary? Can we afford this or that? Um, but the, you, you really can't put a cost on human life. You can't put a cost on the life of, you know, of a teacher, a custodian, a nurse, anyone else going into that building. Um, so, I, you know, I would say there's, there's no cost too high to make sure that the space is safe, obviously for the workers, as well as, of course, the students. You know, we're, we, we know that this disease uh, does affect, um, you know, children and, and younger people less harshly than it affects older people, but that doesn't mean that it's not an issue. And of course, um, you know, we, we also now know that student, that children can, transmit this virus so they can get infected and then they can transmit it to someone else. Um, and, and so we're definitely very concerned as schools reopen, whether that will contribute to a spike in cases of, uh, you know, creating a much greater community transmission um, and putting, uh, you know, working parents, put, putting parents and, and, you know, working parents at risk, um, you know, of being infected by their children and then bringing that, bringing that the virus to their workplaces in turn and then having further community spread. Well, it's been noted before that there are times when it's difficult to know whether somebody gets infected from the workplace itself or if, if it's from community spread and they just happen to be going to work when they realize it. What, what should be done about that when it comes to workers' comp? Yeah, um, so MassCosh, uh, you know, the Massachusetts Coalition for Occupational Safety and Health, we are pushing for an occupational uh, presumption, essentially to say anyone who is working outside of their home um, who is you know potentially exposed to other people um, if that person becomes infected with COVID-19 um, and you know god forbid that that person dies or uh, you know gets sick and is out of work um, and needs to take workers comp that we're pushing for a law that would uh, you know essentially allow workers comp for, for anyone in that situation um, you know the reality like you said this is very very tricky to determine whether a case is work related um, and employers have been taking advantage of that and trying to undermine workers' ability to get workers' comp by denying work-relatedness, knowing that it is hard to prove work-relatedness. Um, we want to say, you know, let's, let's do the opposite of that. You know, we have people that for months we've been calling heroes. We've been going out, you know, on our doorsteps and clapping for them at seven o'clock um, and, you know, celebrating them. And yet, you know, then we're, those same companies are going to turn around and deny, you know, workers come to someone who does get sick, to me, that's, that's abhorrent. So I think it, you know, it's, uh, this is our opportunity as a state, as a society to say, you know, if, if we really value essential workers, if we really value uh, the risk that people are taking by going to work in, in this pandemic, in this ongoing uh, situation, that we need to then be providing those people in that, in those worst cases where they do get sick or, or do the lose their lives, that we need to provide them and their families with workers come. Finally, Ben, uh, if people want to see the report or maybe uh, call in about a workplace concern that they might have trouble getting through elsewhere, is there a way they can do that? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so uh, you can go to our website. It's masscosh.org. That's M-A-S-S-C-O-S-H dot O-R-G. Um, and the report is available on our website. You can, you can read it there. Um, 
And you can also, yeah, uh, you know, in terms of making worker, if, if, for any worker who has, a, who has a complaint or a concern about workplace safety conditions, um, they actually should be contacting the Department of Labor Standards here in Massachusetts, which is enforcing that just the state agency responsible for enforcing the workplace safety standards. Um, so, you know, go, go on your phone, Google Department of Labor Standards and, and find, find that, that uh, complaint form online. Um, but you can also reach out to us and, and MassCosh is uh, able to help you or help you or, or your coworkers address any of those concerns. So you can always call us, we have a, a hotline. Um, you can call our, our phone number at 617-825-SAFE, which is 617-825-7233. Thank you very much. Easy to remember. Easy to remember. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Ben Wallerstein from MassCosh. We'll have more news in just a moment. 